Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. There's still a few people coming in. We've got 70 people at the moment, and now it's up to 72 already. Um, my name is Sean Brady. I'm the managing director here at Brady Hayward, and I'm going to be the host for Jody's seminar today. So the plan is Jody's going to present for about 30 to 40 minutes on what chronic unease looks like in practice. And then we'll go to questions and discussion afterwards and we'll round out the seminar inside the hour. So I'll uh, do the, the formal part of introducing Jody. Jody heads up our, our organizational reliability section here at, at Brady Haywood. Um, she's really interested in helping decision makers in high hazard industries take a whole of systems approach to their safety uh, performance. And that whole of system approach is really, I think, what sets the way Jody approaches this stuff apart. She's got over 20 years experience in mining, heavy manufacturing, explosives, chemicals, and logistics. And she's a passion for fatality prevention and helping organizations achieve high performance. Um, anyone who knows Jody will know that well already. So with that, I will hand you over to Jody now. Thanks, Sean. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome. And I hope you've all got your lunch. This was a lunch uh, lunchtime seminar or brunch for our friends in Western Australia on the call. Um, we're here to talk about chronic unease and what it looks like in practice. And my goal for you today really is to walk away with a deeper and perhaps a more helpful understanding of what chronic unease is and a few practices in your back pocket that you can put in place yourself. Um, and also practices that will help you shape your organization to be able to sustain chronic unease. So what is chronic unease? Well, let's have a look at a hypothetical example that I think explains it. So imagine this is your organization. You're, you value safety and you've got a strategy and goals and plans and KPIs and rewards, and you've got a great reporting system and you're collecting lots of information and um, you've got a major hazards, critical control, risk assessments, audit programs, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you're doing lots uh, in the planning and maintenance and inspections um, space as well. And you've got smart people and they've got a whole bunch of procedures that um, they're being asked to follow. Okay, let's be realistic. There's a hell of a lot of procedures that are being asked to follow. And, um, and their injury rates are really low. Things seem to be going good. There's... Um, Leaders are, um, are engaged in the process and, and messaging, but out of the blue, a big failure occurs and workers might be seriously injured, but a huge ripple will run through the organisation and workers will lose confidence. The regulator might be involved, the unions and senior managers want answers. Nobody's sure about what really went wrong. And so you do an investigation. You might bring people in from outside to do that investigation, but the same thing, but it, and it's really interesting, happens over and over. What you find is not a big smoking gun. Um, you find that there was a bunch of warning signs that were already visible and known before the incident. So the reporting system's got a whole bunch of incidents in there that um, are, are fairly similar to the one you had but didn't quite eventuate. The critical control checks that you were doing um, were all green and missed the control, the weaknesses in the controls. Your people, your people typically um, knew have maybe been um, not following the procedures for good reason. There was probably um, things in there they couldn't follow, but um, you know there were warning signs there as well. Um, the leader's messaging wasn't on uh, was actually leading people to uh, to not report. And, um, and the company goals might have been influencing, um, you know, people to ignore the risks or do workarounds. And the investigation turns all this up and, you know, you think to yourself, it seems so obvious now with hindsight. Why couldn't we think of these things beforehand? Why couldn't we see them beforehand, these warning signs for what they really are and act on them? And this is actually chronic unease after the event. So, and that's, I suppose, what chronic unease is really. It's being able to find those warning signs, identify them and, um, and make them vivid and act on them before you have the failure. And so what I'm gonna show you today is how to make them more vivid. 
So here's a typical definition, um, chronic unease, it's a constant discomfort or a healthy scepticism about, around how your risks are being managed. But really what that, what that is, is a skill set and ability to be able to identify the warning signs and make them vivid and act on them, as I said, before the failure. And that sounds really easy, but there's a whole bunch of things um, that are working against us to be able to naturally do this. So for a start, we're all human. Um, our brain wants to be as effective as it can. Uh, we're processing lots of information, lots of the time it's ambiguous, and we get comfort in patterns and habits. And so, you know, there are um, our body and brain uses heuristics, uh, which are like our mental shortcuts. Um, it, we use optimism bias quite a lot. And, um, and this um, is the tendency to think about negative events like they might not happen to us, the old she'll be right approach. And um, this causes us not to be able to see the warning signs right in front of us. Um, confirm confirmation bias is another one. This is our natural tendency to discard any information that doesn't fit with the way, we, um, the way we're thinking and, um, and the decisions we're making. And normalisation is another really big one. So um, when we're normalising what's happening, um, if we're trying something new or different, uh, even if we know it's risky, when we don't get the bad result the first time, we'll typically um, try it again. And then if we don't get the bad result, we're probably getting actually an immediate reward in terms of our time back. Um, then typically what we'll do is we'll reinforce to ourselves that, um, that that's okay and um, that we're not going to get the bad outcome. And so all of these things are stifling chronic unease all of the time. And we have to actively work hard to have chronic unease and make those warning signs vivid. On top of that, so, I mean, anyone who's read Look at the Shell video, you would have seen that um, they talk about all those biases. What they don't talk about is that um, or the way we actually inherently design our organisations unknowingly suppresses chronic unease in our people. Um, so goal conflict, really, you know, organisations are, are always balancing meeting our primary goals, which are making money, delivering services with our risk appetite for major failures. Um, our leadership messaging can, um, you know, unknowingly suppress people's uh, want to raise incidents. Um, the way we set up our KPIs, the way we reward, the things we choose to discipline on, all of these things, the systems that we have in place, um, the way we get that information to people um, can stifle people's ability to see the warning signs for what they are. <clears throat> and... Um, and this, um, in the centre here, you can see this unclear picture of risk. So we're going to talk about this in more detail in a minute, but this is fundamental. If, if you can't get a clear picture of risk um, in your business that is all the way from the boardroom to the front line, then it's really, really difficult to um, have, a, have a, um, an imagination about what could go wrong and be able to see those warning signs. And I'm, I'm sorry, I missed psychological safety. Uh, there is so much said about psychological safety um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, but we're not gonna go into it too much in this webinar. Okay, so we know that we're not naturally set up for chronic unease, both personally and professionally. So how do you actually get it? Well, there is a bit of research around this um, and there's a couple of books written, which I'm happy to share um, with you later, but, um, you know, there are four kind of broad ingredients that the research focuses on. Um, and the first one is psychological safety. So this is where people feel like they're being, uh, they might be personally punished or judged um, for speaking up about the warning signs or the issues, especially to people more senior. And so they'll choose not to do it um, naturally. And rarely will you know if people are holding back on those things. And, you know, in in an organisation that has lots of chronic unease and um, is identifying those warning signs, you don't want to left think, don't you don't want things to be left unsaid. Uh, the next one, which we are going to talk about lots today, is um, risk competence. And so, you know, it makes sense that the more you know about your risk and how it's being managed, the more you can understand the weaknesses behind it and um, and really dig into how it's being controlled. And when I say risk competence, I'm not talking about just training. I'm talking about a mix of technical knowledge, but also experience and industry history, 
um, data, facts, all of those things. But you need risk competence in order to um, grow chronic unease and identify those warning signs. We are going to talk about this one a bit more as well um, in the session. So systems to detect the warning signs, you need these to um, help you um, overcome the human and organisational components. But these are things like monitoring your physical risk, so gas monitoring systems, dust, um, dust monitoring strata, stuff like that, um, maintenance reliability systems, and, um, and then also the big one, your reporting system. And the last one is a questioning attitude. So this means questioning the assumptions, the unintended outcomes, whether they be positive or negative. Um, if you can't explain them, then they're worth digging into uh, and, um, and any anomalies. And this helps you to explore in depth the work and the risks and um, really get to the real performance of the controls and, um, and understanding where your gaps are. And you can ask things like, um, do we understand why we got that result? Uh, what could be the worst outcome? Uh, how could that control fail? And a big one, which I think the industry needs to ask a whole lot more, and that's what's our backup plan if it does fail? Because um, if you look at a lot of the, um, the in industry big um, failures, it's, it's that there wasn't a backup plan for when that final control actually did fail. So now, as I said, we're not going to talk about psychological safety anymore in detail. We're going to touch on questioning attitude as we go along, but we're going to dig into risk competence and the systems that detect warning signs. So let's go to risk competence. So there's a bunch of practices. You guys will all um, have more um, already. As soon as we start to um, talk about them, they'll come to the surface. But one of the big ones for me is around storytelling. So hands down, one of the best ways to create chronic unease and um, you know, people can retain information, they can learn from a story for longer. But the really big thing about storytelling is that we don't have big failures very often ourselves. And so if you think about optimism bias and normalization here, um, we have to be able to help people to um, get an experience that they'll rarely get. And that's what a story does for us. And you can invite your technical experts to um, to you know, share stories, but also um, to use their, their technical knowledge to help build risk competence and take a teaching role. Um, you can do that um, while you're exploring data. So explore your data in, in different ways, use fresh eyes. Um, but one of my favorite things to do with data is really to get the descriptions behind the numbers. So if you're reporting heaps of numbers all the time or your critical control prog programs all green, um, or your audits 100% um, or your hazards, for example, get into the detail behind that every now and then and really explore what's going on in your data. Um, leadership time in the field is a great way to build risk competence. Take one of your technical experts with you or just take a set of fresh eyes with you. Um, using other mechanisms to learn uh, than your standard ICAM, learning teams, Kaizen, which is a lean approach to continuous improvement. Those things are really, really helpful as well. And they engage lots of people. And what you're trying to do here is bring up the risk competence in your organization. But, and you, know, you can do that at the same time as being passionate yourself about it and, um, and really creating an undercurrent that actually does create chronic unease. The more you know about your risks and controls and how they might fail, the more you will naturally have, risk, um, have chronic unease and be raising those warning signs. The last one is one we are gonna dig into quite a lot. And this is using bow ties as shared risk knowledge. So, you're probably rolling your eyes when I say bow ties, and I know you've probably got a heap of them in your drawer or on a drive somewhere, but I want to show you how to use them in a way that can really create a shared picture of risk for your organisation. And as I said before, you need to be able to create a, a, a single common language from your board all the way through to your front line, to your planners, to your experts. Everybody needs to be thinking about risk in the same way. Um, so 
Just in case you aren't familiar, um, bow ties, you have a major accident or a failure. Um, you can call it a loss of control. You can call it whatever you want in the middle. And then on the right-hand side, you've got a whole bunch of the uh, worst outcomes that could happen. Um, on the left, you've got all of your causes. And then for each of those causes, you map what are the controls that prevent that cause occurring or that threat occurring. And then um, after the event, um, how do we manage not actually ending up in, in that really bad um, consequence? And so, as I said, they're a common language, but they're also something to anchor your business to. It's really, you know, there are a lot of risks and you would have one of these bow ties for each of those, but you need a common language that you can um, pull out and, um, you know, you, you kind of want to have a situation, and I've seen businesses do this really well, where a team can have a near miss and they can come out from their workplace, go back to their bow tie on the wall and follow through, okay, so that was our cause. These were the controls we should have had in place. Which ones of those failed? Which ones were still in place? And they can start to have a really detailed conversation um, with each other based on what the industry, you know, what, what you know as a business about the risk. And um, a good bow tie is like a storybook. So, uh, you know, they should tell the story of every fatality in the industry. So the other thing about bow ties, if they're done well, they allow you to evaluate the controls that you've got and how reliable they are. And um, one of the common ways to do that is, um, is by using hard and soft controls. <clears throat> and you can see I've got hard controls in green with the little green peg and um, red controls are the soft ones. And this is typically what you would see um, on a section of a bow tie. Uh, you might see this many controls and you might see um, only a few, a few hard controls. So hard controls, the most important thing about a hard control is it treats the hazard. It actually does something to manage the hazard. And these are usually engineering or isolation um, controls, if you're thinking about it in terms of the hierarchy. Whereas a soft control manages only the person interacting with the hazard or it's really heavily reliant upon people um, to, for that control to work. And, you know, they, um, they're typically unreliable and they typically don't change the hazard. So, you know, you hear the word soft control, you should be getting some chronic unease about, about that um, as well. Uh, so if we take a questioning attitude now to, um, to what we know about our um, hard and soft controls, we can start to ask things like, do we have enough good controls for each of our causes? And where we've got soft controls, are we comfortable that we're really not doing anything to treat the hazard or is there something we could do to treat the hazard to manage this cause line? And I'm sure this was where your eyes were all going. Do we have any causal pathways without any controls in place? And until you put it on a bow tie, it's really, really difficult to, for that to become vivid to the organisation. And this is what you're after. You're after get a team getting around um, a picture of their risk and starting to really get um, a common understanding and be able to pick out these warning signs. And so a term that's pretty familiar in the mining industry is critical controls. Uh, so some of these controls, we say they're more important than others. Um, they might play a key role in preventing the failure or mitigating the losses afterwards. Um, they're called critical controls. And um, when you look at them on a bow tie, it encourages you to explore in more detail and in explore them in more detail, I suppose, and in different ways. So if we take a questioning attitude to this, we can start to say um, how many of our critical controls are actually soft controls, uh, which is pretty common. So in most assessments that I've done in the industry, you find you've got about a 40% hard control um 60 percent soft control split and um yeah, so that is worth doing and having a look at and making sure you're comfortable with that but the other thing is um where you where you don't have any um these ones here where you've got no critical controls are you willing to accept that are you comfortable that you don't have critical controls on um certain causal lines and that um and that you've got you know other things in place 
And these are all warning signs. So the other thing about critical controls is they get extra special treatment. They get performance standards, and these are really helpful. Um, in essence, a good performance standard should set out, among a lot of other things, the target performance criteria and boundaries around when the control is working or not. And um, you also put a whole bunch of monitoring around them, which we're going to talk about now. So if your controls are working well and they're monitored, it's a really great way to make warning signs more vivid on the things that are important. So. As I said, um, you know, they'll, uh, they can, you can check them. So the, the point here really is that you've got two big opportunities to get some more chronic unease in your business. The first one is um, that you can do, look at all these qualitative checks and, um, and you can match them to the control failures that you're having, having for each of those controls in incidents. So if you think about it, the critical control checks are your proactive and then, so your proactive warning sign and then the number of failures you're having for each of those controls in incident are your reactive. That's where you, your checks didn't really work. So um, this is a really good exercise to do if you haven't done it before. Um, what you will need is to go back and make sure that you are um, mapping all of your critical controls in your system so that you can actually um, pick them up by incident. But, um, and we did this recently with a company and we found this really interesting. We actually did find this trend. So where they were having the most amount of failures, their crit critical control checks were gen generally green. And um, this led them to, you know, that's a warning sign itself. They started to dig deeper and understand whether these critical controls actually were um, preventing that incident occurring and, um, and that if they were checking and me measuring the right things and if they had the right um, performance standards on those. So that's a really nice um, way of going back and checking that. Um, something I haven't seen happen in the mining industry too much, but wow, it would be great um, to do more of is for each of your critical controls, um, if your performance standard is showing that you've got some you know, continuous monitoring, some kind of technology monitoring that. Gas monitoring is a good example. Um, creating a dashboard, like a Power BI dashboard that shows um, by risk, grouped by risk, all of the, um, the monitoring and how that, whether they're uh, within target or not for each of those particular um, critical controls really starts to give you a picture on whether you're in, in control of, um, of your key risks or not. Um, so that can be another way of getting warning signs to come to the surface. And if you take that a step further and, um, and you want to start to make the weaker signals even more vivid, then you can start to overlay all of those pieces, um, all of the pieces together. And you can see down here, I've got a little legend um, which shows that um, you could overlay your hazard reports, your controls that have failed in incident and your results from your control verifications. So we put up all the little um, explosions. These are where all my controls have failed in incident. And you can start to see patterns that you couldn't see if you're just looking at individual incidents alone. And then over the top of that, you can start to overlay where your controls have been weak and they've been identified in your proactive control checks. And I'm sure you can start to see patterns there already happening. And then if I overlay my hazards over the top, um, I can start to see where my people are focusing, my work, um, the people who are reporting the hazards and, um, and where they think the weaknesses are and where they think they're not. And so automatically uh, you can, it draws your attention to this particular line here. So this wouldn't have been a warning sign before, but now it's, um, it's really becoming obvious that, we're, that we've got something that may um, result in a failure here because we've got a whole bunch of controls that aren't working together. And so this is the benefit of a bow tie. You can really start to get a picture of these things and make things more vivid. And so the important thing is that you need to keep these things live. So, um, you know, when they're used well, uh, you can 
put them out when you're doing your incident investigation and use them as the framework for what controls should we actually be looking for um, that could have that were, we thought we had in place that could have failed. And then you would expect to see that same thing by the executive when they're reviewing those, um, those incidents. And there are companies that do this really well. You can use them to plan work. You can use them for risk deep dives. You can do what I just did with the vivid warning signs in terms of analysis. Um, they're a really rich source of warning signs. And you continually update them with learnings from incidents. Uh, and I would really encourage you to use industry learnings there as well. Um, and also what you're learning from your control improvements as well over time. So it wouldn't be a chronic unease webinar without talking about reporting systems and the systems that we've got to capture this. So um, first of all, we might start with, um, have you thought about what types of things you might want to be reported? And here's a bunch of uh, different warning signs reported in a good system, um, according to Professor Andrew Hopkins and his work that he's done on high reliability organisations. So think about your organisation and which ones of these would you see in your system? And I like to use the, um, the approach when I say, have I seen a HPI that, that is one of these warning signs? And I'll just give you a minute there. because I don't reckon I've ever seen a, um, a HPI that self-reports, uh, where there's been a self-reporting of rules that have been routinely violated or, or ignored. <clears throat> and the trouble here is um, you won't get these warning signs until the, you remember the slide that I put up before about the organisation, um, the way we set up, set up our organisation stifles this. Uh, that's, what, that's what actually does stifle these things is, um, is we need to actively reward um, and recognise that these are the right things to be reporting and, um, and encourage them and ask for them and, um, and make sure that we're not actively discouraging them because these are really valuable warning signs. And so if we dig into the reporting system a little bit more, chronic unease is all about making warning signs more vivid. And for that to happen in our reporting system, we want the most important reports to float to the top of the pile or be the most vivid. And um, I'm sure we all agree that the most important warning signs um, or reports are the ones that could come, um, they come from the really high consequence events. <clears throat> and when I say that, it's about they could have resulted in a high consequence, uh, in a serious consequence. Uh, so if we're thinking about actual here, um, then we're actually really limiting the amount of um, reports we're going to get through and, and action. So it's really about all the potential consequence, what could have happened. Forget about what actually happened and just focus on what could have happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. And remember all those biases I talked about all earlier, all those organisational influences, they're working overtime here to um, suppress all of these warning signs float into the top of the pile. And, um, and you've got to work really, really hard uh, to get them to come to the top um, because it's our natural tendency to always judge the seriousness of the, um, of the report based on the actual outcome. But what could have happened is really where we're getting into um, finding out the good warning signs before the failure. Um, so here's an exercise you can do with your organisation uh, to see how much chronic unease your reporting system has. Uh, this is one I do regularly and here is typically what I find. So what you're looking at is a graph of all of the reports entered into um, a reporting system in a year and each bar represents the number of reports by that potential, uh, potential consequence rating that, that, that's been given in the system. And the first thing that stands out is there's a heap not reported. And this is really common, uh, oh, sorry, not rated uh, in the system. So they haven't been given a rating at all. We haven't said whether they're high potential or moderate or low. And, um, and the problem with this 
is it's the opposite to things being vivid and, you know, the right reports coming to the surface. We don't even know what's in these ones. So if you've got this in your system, um, first thing to do is print out all these and have a good look at them and, um, and you'll find a whole bunch of warning signs in here um, that you can use um, to start to form a pattern of whether you've got control weaknesses. The second thing you might find is there's quite a difference between the highs and majors and, um, and the moderates and below. So remember highs, majors are your um, uh, potential consequence of a serious, um, like a death or a um, serious disablement and above. And, um, and these ones here, you, you lost time. This is actually out of, um, this is the uh, risk matrix from a large mining organisation um, out of the Board of Inquiry. Uh, and, but what you can see here, big difference. Uh, I wonder why that difference would be there. Uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll already have um, the, the reasons why. Um, one of those things can be risk competence, being able to imagine that things are, um, could be worse than they, um, than they actually were. Um, the second thing, which is a big barrier in the industry, is mandating formal um, investigations for um, potential fours and fives or highs and majors. Uh, that is a big barrier and it's one that I really encourage organisations to think about um, doing things differently if you want to learn and you want um, those warning signs to come to the surface. How do you um, not make it a punishment for those things um, to come to the surface? Um, KPIs drive this and there's a lot of organisational influences and, and personal influences. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But these are the ones we really want. And um, as you can see in this system, which is really common, there's, there's not a lot in there to, to learn from. So what I would say before you go back and say to your people, I need, to, I need you to report more, um, consider what is in this bucket here. So we saw a big difference. There's a quite a barrier um, to making things a higher or major. Um, the first thing before you ask your people to report more is, um, is have a good look in this moderate column and um, print these out and get some fidelity about what's actually in here. Because uh, in my experience, there's a wealth of high potential reports that have flown under the radar that are sitting in here and they can give you a really rich pattern. Um, it'll also give you a, um, an idea about whether people want to report. Um, if, if they think that things are being underrated all the time, they'll typically, um, after a while, not want to report stuff to you. And control failures are all about warning signs that we want to know about. So chronic unease takes effort to build into your organisations and the culture so it really sticks. Um, it's not just an individual psychology that you can expect and ask from your people. You can't ask them to care more, notice more, um, be more safe, have more chronic unease. It doesn't work like that. You have to build it into your organisation. And we've just been through a bunch of ways to do it, and it's certainly worth it um, because in the end it's all about finding ways to make the warning signs more vivid so you can act on them before they lead to failure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jody. Um, really interesting discussion on um, chronic unease, which I hope has demystified um, some of the aspects of it for, for many people and that there are practices and ways you can go about it, but it takes quite a lot of effort to do and do well. And like a lot of this um, sort of stuff, it's in the nuance of how you do it and it's in the subtlety of how you do it that really starts to, to make a big difference. So we are getting some questions through. Um, I'll start with uh, one of the, usually one of the more controversial ones, the role of KPIs and chronic unease that, uh, you know, I think we certainly see that, you know, organizations want to have more chronic unease, they tell their people they need to have more chronic unease. But what happens, Jody, if they don't change usually the KPIs around that? What happens to in the organization? Yeah, okay. Uh, look, I mean, the, <clears throat> the most controversial one would be where you, where an organisation primarily focuses on recordable injuries or um, personal safety KPIs. There, 
you know, and the reason for that is it creates this almost a false sense of security that, um, that we're managing the risks. So if we have a low recordable injuries <clears throat> and we think that um, that, that means that um, we're managing our risks, then we end up in this situation where we think everything's going okay and we start to pat ourselves on the back that things are good. What's really clear from the research, and there's been a lot of this, and I'm happy to share, um, and we should do a whole webinar on this, Sean, <laughs> because it actually is one. Um, but um, what's really clear from the research is that the causes of recordable injuries are very different to the causes of serious accidents. And you can't think you're um, measuring one and managing the other. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, and the second thing would be that we naturally want um, our KPIs to be um, green and that goes with all of those biases. So we have to actively um, choose KPIs, choose measures that allow us to test, um, you know, you need a suite of, um, of KPIs so you can actually test whether, um, you know, the quality versus the, the quantity of, um, of, of things and critical control activities. A lot of people measure that, but um, you need to go deeper than that and you need to um, think about whether the, your critical controls and the health of your system, and you can use your bow ties to do that, are actually um, giving, uh, giving you a, a chronic unease about your, um, your, your risk and whether it's in control. Cool. Thanks, Jody. Um, keep your questions coming in. Um, and we're starting to get uh, many people um, coming in. Now, we'll start with one because it's related to what you're just talking about, Jody. I think it's worth explaining, exploring a little bit more um, from Corey Pfizer. The major flaw in critical control verification is that people want to generate green and you can actually achieve chronic ease as opposed to unease. Um, can you talk about too much green? I know we've certainly seen quite a bit of this as an issue. Yeah, well, you know, um, we reward green and we ask for green. Uh, so I think, you know, it the the way the leader messages what the results are um, does a lot to you know to to drive whether we're actually getting the real performance of our of our critical controls or whether we're actually getting an appearance of performance. And um, you know, any. I would challenge any organisation that is getting a lot of green in their critical control um, checks of whether actually, you know, you know that, that should be your first warning sign really to, um, to look deeper into the system. And, and if you've got a new, you know, I was talking to a, um, uh, a manager about this recently who said, goodness, actually, you know, the site that I haven't been focusing on the most is, um, is the site that's given me all the greens. But now that you say it, whoa, they're the site that I actually need to, to dig into and, um, and, and spend some more time with and understand why um, they think their critical controls are working so effectively 100% of the time. Yep. Yeah, people want good news and organisations are designed to keep it flowing upwards, aren't they? Um, question from Tim Wall. Hello, Tim. Uh, leadership time in the field is a great opportunity to build a culture of psychological safety. What are your thoughts on what questions leaders should and shouldn't ask? I would just say when Jody's thinking about that, um, you can upvote the, um, the questions here that you're interested in. So jump in and have a look at the questions and give it a tick to, up, to upvote it if, if you want to hear Jody have a crack at it. Questions to um, promote psychological safety. Uh, certainly, uh, tell me more, uh, you know, is one that, um, you know, you're really trying to explore with your workers um, what, you know, what they're thinking and feeling. Uh, and um, so certainly, you know, I think um, that's a really good question is really to, to ask, um, you know, not to come up with the answers or, or to, you know, shut people down. You're really just trying to uh, in encourage uh, an understanding. Yeah, and I think Josh Bryant is on the on the webinar, and yeah, he always talks about just tell me tell me about work, just tell me, and, and what do you wish you had, <laughs> what do you wish was different about your job. Um, question from um, Kerry Edwards, uh, you are correct on needing to report more. However, in my experience, businesses have great difficulty acting on the reports that are coming in from employees. What's the solution to finding a balance between reporting and acting on reports? 
hope that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it's a good one. Um, I, I think, you know, Kerry, getting the, <clears throat> getting people to think about the, um, the potential is a really big one. I know I harped on that in the presentation, but, um, you know, uh, and, and really getting a process in place where not everything needs to be risen up to, you know, dealt with by, dealt with by um, top level leaders. Supervisors should have authority to, um, to manage uh, what they can and act on reports, you know, within, um, within their authority. And um, I know there's one organisation that has, if I can, if I can sort, if you can sort it in a day, um, then the supervisor has authority to put those put that in place. Um, it doesn't mean that the rest of the organisation doesn't learn about that um, and it should be still shared. So there's a difference between um, having to act on everything at the highest level and also um, giving more empowerment to the workforce, but also allowing, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing, um, um, uh, encouraging sharing um, to build that risk competence as well. So use your potential is probably the first point. And, um, and the second point would be really just, um, I suppose, deal with what you've got in front of you before you try and ask for more reports and, um, and give feedback, um, you know, to, to people. I think that's um, instead of asking for reports, actually giving them feedback on what you're doing about it uh, goes a long way. Um, just before we go to the next question, uh, there's one thing that you talk about a lot that I find fascinating is just the concept of how people calculate potential and what we see and where they get it wrong, particularly with the, the battle between li using likelihood and consequence to, to calculate potential. Do you, do you want to talk about that for a moment? I think that's really critical in this. Yeah. Oh, look, I don't think there's much of a place for likelihood um, when we're thinking about the potential at all. So actually it's like a oxymoron <laughs> almost you um you know you it, there just is no place for um considering the likelihood of high consequence events because they happen so rarely anyway you're really just so subjective in in your thoughts around it um just focus on um you know the you can use a question instead of a rating try that and um and this came out in um in a discussion we were having with a leadership team the other day where they said how do i stop my people um underrating stuff well you know and one of the managers came up with a brilliant idea and he said okay let's just put the rating to the side and let's just ask people the question could could someone have been seriously injured here you know given a certain um, a little different set of circumstances just asking that you're going to get an answer that gives you the right rating yeah. Um, Stephen Whitehead says, great presentation. Thanks, Jody. What level of detail is valuable to communicate to the workforce in regards to controls? This can get very busy when producing a bow tie to communicate. Yep, I get you. I understand. Um, I, think, I think bow ties are still the right way to go. I really, what I found is that, um, you know, that the visual picture of risk resonates really well. And I know that can be really complex. Um, I would suggest that not every cause is related to every team. So um, I've actually been through a process with, um, with a site where the supervisors went um, and sat down with their teams and actually said, could this, is this causal line appropriate to us? And they rationalized their bow ties down to about five or six of their top bow ties. And, um, and the causes and controls that were related to them. And, you know, that was a game changer because they started to use it in their JHAs. They could, as I said, they, you know, uh, would walk up and uh, when they would have an incident and they could follow through all the causal lines and get a really good picture for what should have been in place, what the organisation expects to be in place. Um, big, long word documents, um, racks, stuff like that, don't, in my um, experience, don't work with the workforce. And if you show it to the workforce as well, isn't there, Jody? They'll tell you what's rubbish, what controls are rubbish and don't really work, and they're there for the paperwork police, but don't make don't make any real difference to their their job. And that's really true, Sean. Actually, um, you know, are we afraid of putting our bow ties, which is our picture of risk, what we, you know, our taxonomy? We spend a lot of effort putting those things together. Are we afraid of putting those in front of our workers because they will tell us that's bullshit and they don't have those controls in place? I'm not sure. Hmm. Mm. 
Um, Al Barrett asks, what is your view on, this is a lovely controversial one, on quotas for hazard reporting? My experience is that this drives bland superficial reporting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been guilty of this myself, I will say. Um, I think there's a time and a place. Um, I, I wouldn't worry so much about quotas. Um, I would certainly, I think it's worth having a health check every now and then to understand which teams are reporting and which teams aren't, just so you know where to put your focus. Um, but I would also focus on, you know, of every, uh, you get teams that are really prolific reporters, but you'll see only a little top couple of those reports are actually ones with high potential and they're the ones you really want. Um, so, you know, for me, um, high potential is anything where a control has failed on a bow tie. If you put it on your bow tie and you're saying that it's managing a, a causal line that leads to a failure, um, then, um, you know, that, that's, that's as, as close as you can get to um, high potential, especially if there are other controls weak. But I suppose quotas, yeah, not a big fan. Um, I do think it's worth measuring and, um, and looking at hazard reports in, in many, uh, sorry, hazard reporting by team, by type, by, um, so that's hazard type. Um, and really what you're looking for are your gaps more than, um, you know, prolific numbers of reports. Yeah, I remember uh, seeing Andrew Hopkins from ANU present and he talked about one of the most effective things you can do is put in a, um, a monthly prize for the best hazard because it does two things. It says, one, we are going to reward you for this. And two, it, it becomes very vivid to the audience uh, what you're rewarding them from. And, you know, if you reward a really bad hazard that's that's quite scary, then pretty soon you'll have some people go, oh, you really do want these ones. Well, I've got a couple more of them over here that I'm willing to, to tell you about. Yeah, and, um, you know, there are mines who are definitely doing that. So uh, especially in Queensland, I know Cannington Mine have um, some ripper prizes uh, for their uh, best hazards, things like um, laps around racetracks and all sorts of stuff. And, um, yeah, it's a small price to pay and certainly raises the profile that you want and you really you know, as a leadership team are committed to um, getting hazard reports, the important ones. Yeah, I mean, sometimes what, what we do in our work is it just even working out how many hazards per person per year are reported inside your organisation can be quite an eye-opening experience to, to see how infrequent hazards are are reported. Yeah, uh, do you know, um, so you know, in, in the um, investigations we have done on that, you would be surprised, I was really surprised, the average, uh, you know, over all of the companies we've done that for, um, I would say it's nearly less, it's just under one. So that is uh, one hazard reported per person per year. So, you know, are you people telling you everything that you need, you know, to know? I don't know, that would kind of say not really. Um. Question from Joanne. So it's, um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'll pronounce that wrong, Joanne, so I'll, I'll not proceed. So Jody, in my experience, poorly designed monitoring and reporting systems can create distraction and divert attention from things that are more important. Challenge organizations have is to design elegant systems that allow the vivid picture you speak about. This is incredibly hard to achieve. Is there any way industry can collaborate on getting the sophisticated systems that would more vividly and simply highlight issues? I think that's Joanne Scarini. Sounds that's like a right. Joanne that's apologies, yeah. Joanne. Yeah, uh, uh, great question. And um, you know, I, well, one of the things that um, is really missing, especially in the Queensland mining industry, is more collaboration. Um, if you think about the petroleum industry. <clears throat> excuse me, um, the petroleum industry has Safer Together, which is an industry group that does exactly this. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, they have quite an elegant system. And, and this is something where, you know, we could learn from that. The other opportunity uh, to, I suppose, come together and create something that's um, a little bit more user-friendly is um, to work with the regulator. So obviously, um, you know, the Board of Inquiry talked about using critical controls more. Um, it's a focus in the industry, absolutely something that, um, you know, the regulator could collect that data and, um, and, and provide it back as well. But um, to do that, everybody needs to have a consistent um, view on 
Um, what, is, what is a critical control? What are the critical controls for those major hazards? I think we, we're across the major hazards. Um, I don't think we've nailed the critical control bit and the gaps as well. Yep. Thanks, Joanne. Um, John Gartlin, in your experience, how prevalent are poorly executed investigations that result in misleading findings and ineffective corrective actions? Goodness, I feel like I should handball this one to you, Sean. Um, so you had the findings. I mean, if you look at um, the, uh, the fatality report, uh, the majority, it's like 67% of um, serious accidents uh, had soft controls only put in place afterwards. And that's just, you know, blew my mind. It's not, um, you know, and that was the best control that got put in place after a serious accident. And we were, we were happy to put our hand on our heart and say that's as good as we could get. Um, do I think incident investigations are, you know, driving um, the best they can do? Uh, no. You know, I think we're wedded, we're so wedded to ICAM. And, um, and we need to look at things that think past human error a whole lot more and, um, and really take a more of a whole of systems approach. And, you know, ICAM can do that, but um, it does naturally lead you back to thinking about the role of the person. Um, and um, we just know that humans are fallible. And if we don't look past that, we're never going to improve. The one I always find interesting in that is, you know, the barriers that failed, you know, that can often be plenty of administrative barriers. And the solution then is to go put more better administrative barriers in place, even though the last ones um, let you let you down. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline McGillis question. Many organizations need to ensure that KPIs match the risk maturity of their teams. Any advice on getting this right? Sorry, Sean, can you say that again? Yeah, so many organizations need to ensure that KPIs match the risk maturity of their teams. Any advice on getting this right? Um, yeah, so I think the first thing is, um, and, and we did this exercise with a, with a company, is, um, is really looking at um, the KPIs that you've got um, at the moment, but really what are the behaviors you want to drive and, um, and, and seeing whether, first of all, whether you've got the right KPIs, but then um, you can set and, you know, putting hazard quotas is a perfect example that, that will drive a behaviour that you actually, that, that's unintended. So, you know, and it's, you've got to understand the, um, the team. I would suggest that you can go up to, you know, superintendent level um, is a really great place to start or, you know, at the, at the, probably below the site level. So you're really looking at, um, at, a, at a function, so a processing plant or the mine. And, um, and looking at the maturity, you can do maturity assessments, things like that. But, um, but really, you know, primarily um, make sure you've got a really clear split between personal safety and process safety is, is, a, first, um, is a first cut. Um, and it doesn't matter what the maturity of the group you always want to have um, metrics that um, that are telling you about the health of your major hazards. Yeah, um, kind of running on from that, what is what from Kate Brand? What is your opinion on standardised controls across risks for a business group or mine? Um, I think it depends on what you define your controls to be. Uh, it, um, as, uh, you know, as I said before, there's, a, there's about a 60-40 split in the mining industry around 60% um, uh, are, are soft controls and soft controls typically you are really managing the work, not the hazards. So um, they need to be more specific as well. So it depends on that as well. Um, and, and it really depends on the control. So that's a, it's a broad question and we could do a whole webinar on that too. All right, I got a curly one for you here uh, from Chris Hall. Um, both are important, but is the accurate rating of potential level four and five events slash near misses more valuable than thorough investigations? That's oh, a great question. Goodness. Accurate. Well, if you don't identify it in the first place, 
um, the warning signs are not vivid, I suppose, and um, and you're never even going to investigate it. That would probably <laughs> be my short answer. Um, but then it's not even worth raising if you um, if you don't come to um, some kind of understanding around what the causes were and put something in place to fix it. So, ah, oh, goodness, they're both as important as each other. Yeah, and I suppose the the thing that really complicates it as well is just how good are the thorough investigations that, that people believe they're actually doing and what findings are they getting out the other end of them yeah and if you I suppose if you're not doing thorough investigations and um, people are reporting stuff it's ending up in a situation where all that happens is they get blamed um, you're not going to get the reports anyway um, for much longer and you're not going to get the good ones so another question from Corey Pfizer. This is a nice, nice challenging one for you. Um, a little bit of disagreement. Uh, so the notion of reporting of hazards is fundamentally flawed. Don't we rather need frontline people to rather actively and dynamically respond, fix, treat risks as they occur, so no information can be extremely positive? Can you say that again? I'm struggling with your accent today, Sean. Oh, that's okay. Join the, join the, the club. Um, so the notion of reporting hazards is fundamentally flawed. This is Corey's Cor Cor view. Uh, don't we rather need frontline people to rather actively and dynamically respond, fix, treat risks as they occur? And, and then in that case, no information can be extremely positive. Oh, no, I disagree. Um, you know, I think um, absolutely. You're not, you're not trying to, by doing a report, you're not trying to disempower your team to act on it or fix it or do any of that stuff like yeah that's that's not what it's about it's not chuck a report in and, and it's done wait for someone else to fix it the reporting system is all about raising warning signs and raising bad news and being able to pick up patterns and um, and get to a point where you can really get a picture of the health of your system and um, and help your um, you know top level leaders understand what's going on so that they don't make um, decisions that actually are detrimental to the business. We'll take one more, one more question, then we'll bring everything to a close from Damien Bassish. Agree that having a questioning attitude is an important tool, but how do you not overdo this and become the compliance police? Yeah, I suppose it depends on what types of questions you're asking. Um, so you're definitely not asking who questions, you're certainly asking um, how questions, um, how does that happen, how do you do that, um, and you're right, you know, there is, there is stuff written about uh, chronic unease getting to a point where it feels like, you know, people are being judged and, um, you know, and it, and it doesn't need to be like that, uh, it's how you as a leader frame it up, <clears throat> excuse me, so, you know, if you frame it up as a learning opportunity, then you're in a situation where you can ask as many questions as you want and people, all you're doing is actually imparting your passion for um, understanding the risk in others. Cool. I think we'll draw to a close there, Jodie. Thank you very much, Jodie, for all the work that went into putting this together. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, today, we had you know, over 100 people, which was terrific. Thank you very much to Laura behind the scenes who, who made all this happen. Um, we will be sending out a, a handy summary article that includes some of the key information from Jodie's presentation today. There'll be a recording made. Uh, well, the recording is obviously made, uh, but we'll put the recording on YouTube. Uh, meanwhile, if you want to find more information, go to the website, readyhewitt.com.au. There's lots more uh, articles um, there. There's also the link to the Rethinking Safety podcast, which covers some of the territory that, that Jody covered today. And on behalf of all of us here at Brady Hewitt, thank you very much for joining us today. Have a fantastic day, and we'll talk to you again in the future. Thank you.